Section 16 of Gentle Measures in the Management and Training of the Young. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gentle Measures in the Management and Training of the Young by Jacob Abbott. Section 16 Faults of Immaturity. A great portion of the errors and mistakes and of what we call the follies of children arise from simple ignorance. Principles of philosophy, whether pertaining to external nature or to mental action, are involved which have never come home to their minds. They may have been presented, but they have not been understood and appreciated. It requires some tact and sometimes delicate observation on the part of the mother to determine whether a mode of action which she sees ought to be corrected results from childish ignorance and inexperience or from willful wrongdoing. Whatever may be the proper treatment in the later case, it is evident that in the former what is required is not censure but instruction. Boasting a mother came into the room one day and found Johnny disputing earnestly with his cousin Jane on the question which was the tallest. Johnny very strenuously maintaining that he was the tallest because he was a boy. His older brother, James, who was present at the time, measured them and found that Johnny in reality was the tallest. Now there was nothing wrong in his feeling a pride and pleasure in the thought that he was physically superior to his cousin, and though it was foolish for him to insist himself on this superiority in a boasting way, it was the foolishness of ignorance only. He had not learned the principle which half mankind do not seem ever to learn during the whole course of their lives, that it is far wiser and better to let our good qualities appear naturally of themselves than to claim credit for them beforehand by boasting. It would have been much wiser for Johnny to have admitted at the outset that Jane might possibly be taller than he, and then to have awaited quietly the result of the measuring. But we cannot blame him much for not having learned this particular wisdom at five years of age, when so many full-grown men and women never learn it at all. Nor was there anything blameworthy in him in respect to the false logic involved in his argument that his being a boy made him necessarily taller than his cousin, a girl of the same age. There was a semblance of proof in that fact, what the logicians term a presumption. But the reasoning powers are very slowly developed in childhood. They are very seldom aided by any instruction really adapted to the improvement of them, and we ought not to expect that such children can at all clearly distinguish a semblance from a reality in ideas so extremely abstruse as those relating to the logical connection between the premises and the conclusion in a process of ratiocination. In this case, as in the other, we expect them to understand at once, without instruction, what we find is extremely difficult to learn ourselves. For a large portion of mankind prove themselves utterly unable ever to discriminate between sound arguments and those which are utterly inconsequent and absurd. In a word, what Johnny requires in such a case as this, not ridicule to shame him out of his false reasoning, nor censure or punishment to cure him of his boasting, but simply instruction. And this instruction it is much better to give not in direct connection with the occurrence which indicated the want of it. If you attempt to explain to your boy the folly of boasting in immediate connection with some act of boasting of his own, he feels that you are really finding fault with him. His mind instinctively puts itself into a position of defence, and the truth which you wish to impart to it finds a much less easy admission. If, for example, in this case Johnny's mother attempts on the spot to explain to him the folly of boasting, and to show how much wiser it is for us to let our good qualities, if we have any, speak for themselves, without any direct agency of ours in claiming the merit of them, he listens reluctantly and nervously as to a scolding in disguise. If he is a boy well managed, he waits perhaps to hear what his mother has to say, but it makes no impression. 
If he is badly trained, he will probably interrupt his mother in the midst of what she is saying, or break away from her to go on with his play. A right mode of treatment. If now, instead of this, the mother waits until the dispute and the transaction of measuring have passed by and been forgotten, and then takes some favourable opportunity to give the required instruction, the result will be far more favourable. At some time, when tired of his play, he comes to stand by her to observe her at her work, or perhaps to ask her for a story, or after she is put into bed and is about to leave him for the night, she says to him as follows, I'll tell you a story about two boys, Jack and Henry, and you shall tell me which of them came off best. They both went to the same school, and were in the same class, and there was nobody else in the class but those two. Henry, who was the most diligent scholar, was at the head of the class, and Jack was below him, and of course, as there were only two, he was at the foot. One day there was company at the house, and one of the ladies asked the boys how they got along at school. Jack immediately said, Very well, I am next to the head of my class. The lady then praised him, and said that he must be a very good scholar to be so high in the class. Then she asked Henry how high he was in his class. He said he was next to the foot. The lady was somewhat surprised, for she, as well as the others present, supposed that Henry was the best scholar. They were a little puzzled too, for Henry looked a little roguish and sly when he said it. But just then the teacher came in and she explained the case, for she said that the boys were in the same class and they were all that were in it so that Henry, who was really at the head, was next but one to the foot, while Jack, who was at the foot, was next but one to the head. On having this explanation made to the company, Jack felt very much confused and ashamed, while Henry, though he said nothing, could not help feeling pleased. And now, asked the mother in conclusion, which of these boys do you think came off the best? Johnny answers that Henry came out the best. Yes, adds his mother, and it is always better that people's merits, if they have any, should come out in other ways than by their own boasting of them. It is true that this case of Henry and Jack does not correspond exactly, not even nearly, in fact, with that of Johnny and his cousin, nor is it necessary that the instruction given in these ways should logically conform to the incident which calls them forth. It is sufficient that there should be such a degree of analogy between them that the interest and turn of thought produced by the incident may prepare the mind for appreciating and receiving the lesson. But the mother may bring the lesson nearer if she pleases. I will tell you another story, she says. There were two men at a fair. Their names were Thomas and Philip. Thomas was boasting of his strength. He said he was a great deal stronger than Philip. Perhaps you are, said Philip. Then Thomas pointed to a big stone which was lying upon the ground and dared Philip to try which could throw it the farthest. Very well, said Philip. I will try, but I think it very likely you will beat me, for I know you are very strong. So they tried, and it proved that Philip could throw it a great deal farther than Thomas could. Then Thomas went away looking very much incensed and very much ashamed, while Philip's triumph was altogether greater for his not having boasted. Yes, says Johnny, I think so. The mother may, if she pleases, come still nearer than this if she wishes to suit Johnny's individual case without exciting any resistance in his heart to the reception of her lesson. She may bring his exact case into consideration, provided she changes the names of the actors so that Johnny's mind may be relieved from the uneasy sensitiveness which is so natural for a child to feel when his own conduct is directly the object of unfavourable comment. It is surprising how slight a change in the mere outward incidents of an affair will suffice to divert the thoughts of the child from himself in such a case and enable him to look at the lessons to be imparted without personal feeling and so to receive it more readily. Johnny's mother may say, There might be a story in a book about two boys that were disputing a little about which was the tallest. 
What do you think would be good names for the boys if you were making up such a story? When Johnny has proposed the names, his mother could go on and give an almost exact narrative of what took place between Johnny and his cousin, offering just such instructions and such advice as she would like to offer. And she will find, if she manages the conversation with ordinary tact and discretion, that the lessons which she desires to impart will find a ready admission to the mind of her child simply from the fact that, by divesting them, of all direct personal application she has eliminated from them the element of covert censure which they would otherwise have contained very slight disguises will in all such cases be found to be sufficient to veil the personal applicability of the instruction so far as to divest it of all that is painful or disagreeable to the child he may have a vague feeling that you mean him but the feeling will not produce any effect of irritation or repellency. Now the object of these illustrations is to show that those errors and faults, which when we look at their real and intrinsic character, we see to be results of ignorance and inexperience, and not instances of willful and intentional wrongdoing, are not to be dealt with harshly, and made occasions of censure and punishment. The child does not deserve censure or punishment in such cases, what he requires is instruction. It is the bringing in of light to illuminate the path that is before him, which he has yet to tread, and not the infliction of pain to impress upon him the evil of the missteps he made, in consequence of the obscurity in the path behind him. Indeed, in such cases as this, it is the influence of pleasure rather than pain that the parent will find the most efficient means of aiding him. That is, in these cases, the more pleasant and agreeable the modes by which he can impart the needed knowledge to the child. In other words, the more attractive he can make the paths by which he can lead his little charge onward in its progress towards maturity, the more successful he will be. Ignorance of Material Properties and Laws In the example already given, the mental immaturity consisted in imperfect acquaintance with the qualities and the action of the mind and the principles of sound reasoning. But a far larger portion of the mistakes and failures into which children fall, and for which they incur undeserved censure, are due to their ignorance of the laws of external nature and of the properties and qualities of material objects. A boy, for example, seven or eight years old, receives from his father a present of a knife with a special injunction to be careful of it. He is accordingly very careful of it in respect to such dangers as he understands, but in attempting to bore a hole with it in a piece of wood, out of which he is trying to make a windmill, he breaks a small blade. The accident in such a case is not to be attributed to any censurable carelessness, but to want of instruction in respect to the strength of such a material as steel, and the nature and effects of the degree of tempering given to knife blades. The boy had seen his father bore holes with a gimlet, and the knife blade was larger, in one direction at least, that is in breadth, than the gimlet, and it was very natural for him to suppose that it was stronger. What the boy needs in such a case, therefore, is not a scolding or punishment, but simply information. A girl of about the same age, a farmer's daughter, we will suppose, under the influence of a dutiful desire to aid her mother in preparing the table for breakfast, attempts to carry across the room a pitcher of milk, which is too full, and she spills a portion of it upon the floor. The intention good. The mother forgetting the good intention which prompted the act and thinking only of the inconvenience which it occasions her administers at once a sharp rebuke the cause of the trouble was simply that the child was not old enough to understand the laws of momentum and of oscillation that affect the condition of a fluid when subjected to movements more or less irregular she has had no theoretical instruction on the subject and is too young to have acquired the necessary knowledge practically by experience or observation. It is so with a very large portion of the accidents which befall children. 
they arise not from any evil design nor even anything that can properly be called carelessness on their part but simply from the immaturity of their knowledge in respect to the properties and qualities of the material objects with which they have to deal it is true that children may be and often doubtless are in fault for these accidents the boy may have been warned by his father not to attempt to bore with his knife blade or the girl forbidden to attempt to carry the milk pitcher the fault however would be even in these cases in the disobedience and not in the damage that accidentally resulted from it and it would be far more reasonable and proper to reprove and punish the fault when no evil followed than when the damage was the result for in the latter case the damage itself acts ordinarily as a more than sufficient punishment misfortunes befalling men these cases are exactly analogous to a large case of accidents and calamities that happen among men a shipmaster sails from port at a time when there are causes existing in the condition of the atmosphere and in the agencies in readiness to act upon it that must certainly in a few hours result in a violent storm he is consequently caught in a gale and his top masts and upper rigging are carried away the owners do not censure him for the loss which they incur if they are only assured that the meteorological knowledge at the captain's command at the time of leaving port was not such as to give him warning of the danger and provided also that his knowledge was as advanced as could reasonably be expected from the opportunities which he had enjoyed but we are very much inclined to hold children responsible for as much knowledge of the sources of danger around them as we ourselves with all our experience have been able to acquire and are accustomed to condemn and sometimes even to punish them for want of this knowledge indeed in many cases both with children and with men the means of knowledge in respect to the danger may be fully within reach and yet the situation may be so novel and the combination of circumstances so peculiar that the connection between the causes and the possible evil effects does not even occur to the minds of the persons engaged an accident which has just occurred at the time of this present writing will illustrate this a company of workmen constructing a tunnel for a railway when they had reached the distance of some miles from the entrance prepared a number of charges for blasting the rock and accidentally laid the wires connected with the powder in too close proximity to the temporary railway track already laid in the tunnel the charges were intended to be fired from an electric battery provided for the purpose but a thundercloud came up, and the electric force from it was conveyed by the rails into the tunnel and exploded the charges, and several men were killed. No one was inclined to censure the unfortunate men for carelessness in not guarding against a contingency so utterly unforeseen by them, though it is plain that, as is often said to children in precisely analogous cases, they might have known. Children's Studies Spelling there is perhaps no department of management of children in which they incur more undeserved censure and even punishment and are treated with so little consideration for faults arising solely from the immaturity of their minds than the direction of what may be called school studies few people have any proper appreciation of the enormous difficulties which a child has to encounter in learning to read and spell how many parents become discouraged and manifest their discouragement and dissatisfaction to the child in reproving and complaints at what they consider his slow progress in learning to spell forgetting that in the english language there are in common everyday use eight or ten thousand words almost all of which are to be learned separately by a bare and cheerless toil of committing to memory with comparatively little definite help from the sound we have ourselves become so accustomed to seeing the word bear for example when denoting the animal spelt b e a r that we are very prone to imagine that there is something naturally appropriate in those letters and in that collocation of them to represent that sound when used to denote that idea but what is there in the nature and power of the letters to aid the children in perceiving or when told in remembering 
whether when referring to the animal he is to write B-E-A-R or B-A-R-E or B-A-I-R or B-A-Y-R or H-E-R-E as in where so with the word you it seems to us the most natural thing in the world to spell it y-o-u and when the little pupil judging by the sound writes y-u we mortify him by our ridicule as if he has done something in itself absurd but how is he to know except by the hardest most meaningless and distasteful toil of the memory whether he is to write y-o-u or y-u or y o o or e w e or y e w or y u e as in flu or even y o as in do and to determine when and in what cases respectively he is to use those different forms the truth is that each elementary sound that enters into the composition of words is represented in our language by so many different combinations of letters in different cases that the child has very little clue from the sound of a syllable to guide him in the spelling of it we ourselves from long habit have become so accustomed to what we call the right spelling which of course means nothing more than the customary one that we are apt to imagine as has already been said that there is some natural fitness in it and a mode of representing the same sound which in one case seems natural and proper in another appears ludicrous and absurd we smile to see laugh spelled l a r f just as we should to see scarf spelled s c a u g h or scarf as in half and we forget that this perception of apparent incongruity is entirely the result of long habit in us and has no natural foundation and that children cannot be sensible of it or have any idea of it whatever they learn in learning to talk what sound serves as the name by which the drops of water that they find upon the grass in the morning is denoted but they can have no clue whatever to guide them in determining which of the various modes by which precisely that sound is represented in different words as d e w d o d u e d u d o o and d o u it is to be employed in this case and they become involved in hopeless perplexity if they attempt to imagine how it ought to be spelled and we think them stupid because they cannot extricate themselves from the difficulty on our calling upon them to think no doubt there is a reason for the particular mode of spelling each particular word in the language but that reason is hidden in the past history of the word and in facts connected with its origin and derivation from some barbarous or dead language and it is utterly beyond the reach of each generation of spellers as if there were no such reasons in existence there cannot be the slightest help in any way from the exercise of the thinking or the reasoning powers it is true that the variety of the modes by which a given sound may be represented is not so great in all words as it is in these examples though with respect to a vast number of the words in common use the above are fair specimens they were not specially selected but were taken almost at random and there are very few words in the language the sound of which might not be represented by several different modes take for example the last three words of the last sentence which as the words were written without any thought of using them for this purpose may be considered perhaps as a fair specimen of words taken actually at random the sound of the word several might be expressed in perfect accordance with the usage of english spelling as c e v e r a l s e v e r u l s e v a r a l c e v u r a l and in many other different modes the combinations d i p h e r a n t d i f e r u n t d y f f e r e n t 
D-I-F-F-U-R-U-N-T, and many others would as well represent the sounds of the second word as the usual mode. And so with modes, which according to the analogy of the language, might as well be expressed by M-O-A-D-S, M-O-W-D-E-S, M-O-A-D-E-S, M-O-H-D-E-S, or even M-H-O-D-E-S, as in roads. An exceptionally precise speaker might doubtless make some slight difference in the sounds indicated by the different modes of representing the same syllable as given above, but to the ordinary appreciation of childhood the distinction in sound between such combinations, for example as ant in constant and ent in different, would not be perceptible. Now when we consider the obvious fact that the child has to learn mechanically, without any principles whatever to guide him in discovering which, out of the many different forms, equally probable, judging simply from a knowledge by which the sounds of the word is to be expressed is the right one, and considering how small a portion of his time each day is or can be devoted to this work, and that the number of words in common use, all of which he is expected to know how to spell correctly by the time that he is twelve or fifteen years of age, is probably ten or twelve thousand. There are in Webster's Dictionary considerably over a hundred thousand. When we take these considerations into account, it would seem that a parent, on finding that a letter written by his daughter, twelve or fourteen years of age, has all but three or four words spelled right, ought to be pleased and satisfied, and to express his satisfaction for the encouragement of the learner, instead of appearing to think only of the few words that are wrong, and disheartening and discouraging the child by attempts to make her ashamed of her spelling. The case is substantially the same with the enormous difficulties to be encountered in learning to read and write. The names of the letters, as the child pronounces them individually, give very little clue to the sound that is to be given to the word formed by them. Thus the letters H-I-T, as the child would pronounce them individually, H-I-T, would naturally spell to him some word such as H-I-T, not hit at all. And as for the labour and difficulty of writing, a mother who is impatient at the slow progress of her children in the attainment of the art would be aided very much in obtaining a just idea of the difficulties which they experience by sitting upon a chair and at a table both much too high for her, and trying to copy Chinese characters by means of a hair pencil, and with her left hand the work to be closely inspected every day by a stern Chinaman of whom she stands in awe, and all the minutest deviations from the copy pointed out to her attention with an air of dissatisfaction and reproval. Effect of ridicule. There is perhaps no one cause which exerts a greater influence in chilling the interests that children naturally feel in the acquisition of knowledge than the depression and discouragement which result from having their mistakes and errors, for a large portion of which they are in no sense to blame, made subject of censure or ridicule. The effect is still more decided in the case of girls than in that of boys, the gentler sex being naturally so much more sensitive. I have found in many cases, especially in respect to girls who were far enough advanced to have had a tolerably full experience of the usual influences of schools, that the fear of making mistakes and of being thought stupid has had more effect in hindering and retarding progress by repressing the natural ardour of the pupil and destroying all alacrity and courage in the efforts to advance than all other courses combined. Stupidity how ungenerous and even cruel it is to reproach or ridicule a child for stupidity is evident when we reflect that any supposed inferiority in his mental organisation cannot by any possibility be his fault. The question what degree of natural intelligence he shall be endowed with in comparison with other children is determined not by himself but by his creator and depends probably upon conditions of organisation in his cerebral system as much beyond his control as anything abnormal in the feature of his face or blindness or deafness or any other physical disadvantage. 
The child who shows any indication of inferiority to others in any of these respects should be the object of his parents' or his teacher's special tenderness and care. If he is near-sighted, give him at school a seat as convenient as possible to the blackboard or the map. If he is hard of hearing, place him near the teacher, and for reasons precisely analogous, if you suspect him to be of inferior capacity, help him gently and tenderly in every possible way. Do everything in your power to encourage him and to conceal his deficiencies, both from others and from himself, so far as these objects can be attained consistently with the general good of the family or of the school. And, at all events, let those who have in any way the charge of children keep the distinction well defined in their minds between the faults which result from evil intentions or deliberate and willful neglect of known duty and those which, whatever the inconvenience they may occasion, are in part or in whole the result of mental or physical immaturity. In all our dealings, whether with plants or animals, or with the human soul, we ought, in our training, to act very gently in respect to all that pertains to the embryo condition. End of section 16